definitely don't watch this one because this one's gonna be a little bit longer one. We're gonna kind of sit down, chat. We got our tea. We got some food. And we're just gonna kind of chill. We're gonna kind of talk a little bit about what's been going on. Um, I've been wanting to do one of these videos for a while now. Um, I like this setup too. I like like the dungeon hunters in the background, kind of just chilling, watching us. You know, music in the background. The music might be a little bit loud, so we're gonna tone that down just a little bit. But then, and then me in the Sour Llama Studios. Why not? So, I guess first and foremost, thank you. Um, we've got a lot going on in the next couple of months and it's going to be really cool. I'm really excited. It's going to be great. Um, I'll tell you what, we've, we've got a lot of cool things to, uh, to announce and I'm just, I'm ready to share it with you guys. And some of the cool things that I've been learning over the last, like, I don't know, month or so is that this game's a lot different than it was. <laughs> like, a lot different. And I know that now. Um, you know, for those of you who have been here since the beginning of the journey, um, Tower Forcer doesn't look anything like it used to. And again, we're gonna talk a little bit about the next change that's about to happen. Um, and it's not a bad change either. You know, I've realized that, you know, we have a lot of things to do, but yeah, so it's a lot different than it used to be. You know, it used to be a lot of a harder game. It used to be something that, you know, we had a lot of different kind of ideas for and like, we just wanted to do this, do that, do this, but it's kind of, not only has it simplified over the last three years, but it's also gotten easier and it's become a game that you can play with anybody. You know, when we first started marketing the game, you know, this was the dark souls of board games and it was geared for hardcore gamers to now where I have seven, eight year olds coming up to the table, playing the game, understanding the game and beating the game. So yeah, so it's it's a lot different than it was. Um, and it, for those of you who want to see a play test or to actually play test, contact me. Um, and then also for those of you who want to see the play test, we're actually going to do a couple play tests here pretty soon. Um, we got an actual official play test video that we're going to record and that we're going to put up everywhere. I'm so excited for that actually. Um, and I know I've talked about this in the past and you guys are getting sick of me talking about it, but it's going to be for the Kickstarter. And I'm actually really excited because that's going to be more of a reality very, very soon. Um, not to dive into my personal life or anything like that with you guys, but I'm back. Like for those of you who know about Sour Llama Studios, I started it, I was gone. I came back full blast. We did this for during COVID for like a year. And then I just disappeared off the face of the earth. I'm back. Um, we're going to start diving into some deep Sour Llama Studio stuff here. You're going to see a lot of me. It's going to be great. I'm really excited, actually. <laughs> so, yeah. So, but to get back on track, what is happening now? What are the next stages? What are these, what are these dungeon hunters facing now? And I'm really, really excited because... When we design Tower Force, so we have 20 dungeon hunters, we have seven towers, we have over a hundred cards in the battle deck. So that's your attack and defense cards that you use to defend the and attack the towers. We have roughly 20 items or so. And so what we would do is we'd go play test these games and good. All right, that's good. Something was missing. So there was there was something that wasn't quite there. And actually, last year during Origins, we made the decision: we have too many cards. <laughs> so the really cool thing, and actually, these guys that you see on screen now, maybe a spoiler alert. Oh no! Now, now he's gone. But um, so we're gonna cut half of those dungeon hunters. So when you first start. Tower Enforcer? I forgot the game. <laughs> For a second, I was like, what? 
When you start Tower Enforced, you are now only going to have 10 Dungeon Hunters. Where are those other Dungeon Hunters going? Ah, that's the trick right there. I'm really excited to talk about that soon. I don't know if I'm ready to talk about it yet today. Maybe, we'll see. We'll see how much tea I get in me. Um, but so 10 of those Dungeon Hunters are gonna be cut away. And I can tell you some of them, are there, none of these are gonna go away. You're going to be able to play these Dungeon Hunters soon, okay? You're gonna be able to sit down and play your favorite Dungeon Hunters and play up against the towers with them, okay? But they're being, some of them are being cut. Um, and the reason behind that is, is there was just too many. And there was too much variety as well. Um, so as, as you know, if you've been around, um, Bruce is our most powerful dungeon hunter. 25 HP, 12 attack, it, it's kind of ridiculous. We are kind of nerfing a lot in the game. We are making it so it's either more we're not it's not either we're making more of a variety of the special abilities that you can have for the tower enforcers or for the for the um the dungeon hunters um so that it's not the stats that are going to hold you up because there are some there are some gameplay um you know some instances where you pull say for Ari um, and, um, she has, uh, I gotta stop looking at that screen. This is so good. Okay, cool. Say for Bet, that is on the screen right now. Um, he is a much more powerful dungeon hunter, or less so than, uh, Bruce. And the only thing that separates them is, is really their, their abilities now. So some of the abilities are going to be, you know, Use 5 HP to, you know, give yourself 5 energy and stuff like that. So, with that happening now, we are going to allow the player, yourself, to have a much more variety scope of dungeon hunters instead of looking for those certain dungeon hunters that you want to play. So, say if you pull, again, Ori or even Ekim, Ekim is a lower level, even though he's a legend. He may be, um, you know, a, a lower level stat. You're like, oh, shoot. Okay, cool. Then I don't want this, and I know that I'm going to lose the game. That's not what we're after. We want people to be able to have that sense of being able to go into the game and be able to beat the game with whatever they have. We want there to be some challenge to the game, but at the same time, I don't want somebody to pull a card, say Orin, or Orion, and Orin, or Orin pull. I like that. Maybe it'll be a son. Who knows? I don't want them to pull a card right off the bat, a dungeon hunter, and be like, oh, this sucks. So what we're doing is we are going to even out the stats more. So some of them were like six and nine, you know, and stuff like that. They're going to be more, they're going to be more fluctuated. It's, there's still going to be a variety. There's still going to be some dungeon hunters that are more powerful than others, but it's going to be to the point in which it's not going to be game breaking anymore. It's not going to be a game. It's not going to be a deal buster. So deal breaker. <laughs> so yeah. So... I want to make sure that the game is a little bit more balanced than it has been. Um, you know, we've we've got a lot of good things in the game. We've got a lot of really interesting, um, you know, events that happen and stuff as well. But we're kind of starting to tweak things to where we need to be sure that you guys are having fun while still having that you know, that, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you're still looking for that challenge in the game. So as you go through the towers, it's still difficult. And you're still not sure if you're going to win or not, but it's much more than a, oh God, I'm not going to win this game. And I'm just going to have to, you know, learn how to perfect it. 
you don't have to perfect it anymore. You can go through and get lucky and, and beat this game, which is great. I'm happy for that. I'm, I'm glad. It's going to be good. So not only are the dungeon um, hunters changing, but some of the events are going to change. Some of the events are actually going to be removed completely from the game. Um, and then some of the uh, different um, items, we are actually going to be boistering up on items more. And there's going to be a change to the battle deck. Um, the battle deck um, uses energy or gets you energy for if you're attacking or defending against the monsters uh, in the towers. And that's good. And that we're going to keep that. But there's going to be a bit more of a change to that. Um, I feel like that just attacking and defending is great in, in, in its basic lore of it. It's, it, it's, it's not exactly what we want. My thought behind the process of the battle deck and battling against these towers is very much like the reminiscent of, you know, old... You know medieval battles you know which is i i know that's kind of weird but my my take on a lot of this is like well how would they do it back then or how would i envision myself going up against this tower what would i do and slashing and defending is not really the only thing that i would like to do um so we're gonna do a couple of tweaks we're gonna test a few things um, and we're going to see how it goes, but I'm excited for it. I'm excited to see this, this small tweak to make it a little bit more interesting. Um, you know, and I think too, what it might be is it might just be wording. It might just be that we have a different word for attack sometimes or a different word for defend sometimes. And it's not just those, you know, black and, you know, other cards that, you know, that have more things on it because the battle deck's very lame right now. So that's a change that's going to happen very soon, actually. And we'll start posting more about that in, um, in a little bit. Um, but yeah, so it's going to be pretty cool. I'm excited for the big, the big change of the dungeon hunters. I'm excited with how that's going to affect and how that's going to change the game a little bit. I think that when we get down to the brass tacks of it, we want to make sure that you guys have fun. Of course, we're making a game. You know, it's not a torture device. It was in the beginning, but it's not anymore. <laughs> so we want to make sure that we have some fun with it. We want to make sure that we enjoy it together and that, you know, there's a lot more um, longevity to it. Um, so yeah, it's going to be pretty cool. I'm excited. So... As we dive a little bit deeper into Tower Enforcer and kind of the things that are happening, I think that one of the things that we need to kind of discuss a little bit more is the lore about it. You know, we've we've definitely um, have a massive amount of lore, and I keep telling people that we have lore, and I don't think a lot of it is out. I don't think a lot of it is is available to the general public. Um, I think we've been sitting on a lot of it. Um, I know that we've had our streams back in the day um, and we kind of discussed who the dungeon hunters are and we've kind of talked a little bit about, you know, just the in general kind of stuff. But at the same time, I want to be sure that you all understand the overarching story. You know, I think that stories are driven a lot of this they, 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 they are absolutely insane actually you know um, and just looking at these dungeon hunters come up on my screen right now and just thinking about the overarching just in general story of Tower Enforcer and the dungeon hunter universe like what? <laughs> it's kind of crazy like that we all sat down and kind of came up with all this and you know I know that I I have not done this alone by any means um, Mal the artist and B one of the writers 
one of the main writers, um, they both had a huge part in creating a lot of it. Um, you know, I understand that it's it's kind of my thing, but a lot of it is to what they've come up with, what you guys have come up with. I've seen, and, and you know, and, and we'll get into that a lot later. Like, you know, the, further down the line, the RPG, the tabletop RPG is going to be insane. And I am so excited. Like, I know that I keep talking about, you know, how we're going to do Tower Enforcer. We're doing this and this and this. One of my most, like, not even backburner, because I think about it every day, is the tabletop RPG for this game. And like how that's going to intersect with Tower Enforcer, how it's going to intersect with some of the, with some of the expansion packs that we have planned. And yeah, we've got expansion packs planned. We we have a whole bunch of stuff. And like, I'm not stupid, okay? I understand that this can be a one shot and done, and it's over. And I got to go work at the Jiffy. <laughs> but you know, what my plan is that Tower Enforcer is going to live forever. Um, we have a huge amount of content that I want to show you guys. You know, the the expansions are absolutely insane. You know, I've, I've been able to talk with a lot of people about ideas for the expansions. And just like, and I think one of the ones that you guys already know about is the familiars. Um, and how that interjects with just being a dungeon hunter. And, and how that is just... Great. And I'm so excited for that. I wanted that in the base game, but I realized it's a little bit much. So <laughs> we pulled it from the base game. It might be part of the um, uh, Kickstarter. It might be a stretch goal. So if we can make that stretch goal um, of $1 million. No, I'm joking. Um, but if we make that stretch goal, we could possibly put that in the base game. And, and that would be awesome. I'd love to see the familiars with the base game. I wanted that so bad, but it's just, it's, there's, there's a lot of just, you know, different things. We have to, you just, you gotta fit it in and it's, it's kind of crazy. So, um, but yeah, no. So, I don't know where to start with them more because there's just so much of it already. So, I want to talk, I guess, actually, you know what's funny? is I had a brief story of the Dungeon Hunters. Uh, and I want to, I kind of want to read that to you guys. I want to share that with you. And so you guys kind of understand a little bit. And some of this might have changed by now. Some of this might have done a little bit more stuff. But it's, it's, it's a general gist of kind of where you're coming from. So if you were in the Kingdom of Balaki, so that's what the name of the kingdom is. And and who knows where in the universe this place is. But I'm, I am I came up with a really great uh, quote as I was thinking about the, the stream today. And it, and it came along the lines of a lot of these stories, a lot of, a lot of the, you know, Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder or, you know, um, a lot of these big stories, a lot of your stories that you've come from, I think are all from the same universe because they're all just so epic. Even the story of the guy that made the sandwich and just wanted a sandwich is, is, is something that is, is epic. And actually that's funny because that's, that's something that's going to eventually happen in this universe. The guy who just wants a sandwich just wants to eat a sandwich but can't um but a lot of these stories i feel like are from the same universe they're just told differently or they're told in a in a different land um and and it makes me and it makes me hopeful that the story of balaki uh and the dungeon hunter universe is somewhere out there you know in in that D, &D realm and you know if you travel you know the lands far and wide or a different planet or something along those lines that we're all kind of just intertwined um that's really cool so that's my weird rambling for the day um but <laughs> so yeah so the dungeon hunter universe is based in a kingdom or uh called balaki and it's a big giant island and we actually have a map of it um uh the land is large and vast with many different environments uh the north holds cold frigid lands of bandits and thieves 
where the South has deserts that hold many secrets. Um, most of the population resides in the middle of these two uh, zones. Uh, uh, and, and it's and it, it, it's just, it has much more of a peace feel to it. There's not a, a lot of things that are going on along there. Um, uh, but it is far from peaceful. Um, a lot of monsters and bandits uh, that like to uh, attack villages um, and outposts every chance they get. So there's a big issue. And we'll actually talk about the arrows as well. I think we actually do talk about the arrows. Um, and I'm really excited because um, I'll tell you about the arrows once we get there. But yeah, so um, the, the, those monsters and those uh, raiders that attack only uh, are backing off to gather reinforcements and raid these areas again. Um, they want to gain... Um, they only want to um, make sure that they get as much loot and as much powerful things as there is. Through the eras, there's been a lot of um, a lot of treasure lost and a lot of uh, different powerful items that you can gain. To you know, definitely. Um, but uh, there are heroes. There are heroes called dungeon hunters um, who go out and seek these beasts out and seek these raiders out to get their kingdom's loot back. To make sure that they um, don't uh, don't lose the culture and the items that they once had. Um, so, what happens is um, the kingdom uh, of Balaki, as of right now, can be summarized up into eight eras, um, and each era uh, lasts about sixty years or so. Um, and each era is actually broken into a, a young, uh, middle, and old age. Um, so yeah, so, um, the first era that we know of in the Balaki, uh, storybooks, where it really started, where, where history became written, um, is when the f dungeon hunters first began popping up to help saving these people and towns. Um, it was more of a need, uh, than a protection, um, for protection, uh, and this job was, uh, much more of a noble, um, and uh, well, people well skilled in fighting. Um, some of the um, greatest legendary dungeon hunters were part of this era and are revered um, as some of the more noble and historic and heroic in, in all of the kingdom. Um, only three cities were formed at this point um, in the kingdom. Uh, cities, uh, uh, people were extremely poor at this point and most had to grow their own food um, many farmers, um, much of this time can be described as uh, the medieval ages. So, you know, just surviving and even less than, you know, that, you know, great potato famines and stuff, just you know, horrible. Um, but the second era, so 60 years after this era, after the first era, um, uh, the second era saw a decline in the monsters and raiders. Uh, this era is when many of the dungeon hunters began fighting themselves. Uh, it was... Um, Just reading my notes <laughs> but yes um the second era is when they wanted to gain glory and riches for themselves um they kind of lost sight of the main objective um of being a dungeon hunter um there was training um to become a dungeon hunter and then they were taught about this era um so when you're when when you become a dungeon hunter when you go in um and we'll talk about that a lot later um, and that's going to be a lot of RPG stuff. But when you when you decide to become a dungeon hunter, when you yourself are like, you know what, I want to go out and face the face these foes that threaten our kingdom. It's more of a, it's more of a. How do I describe it? It's not a like a. You're not going out and learning. Like it's not like a Jedi kind of. It kind of is actually, but not really. <laughs> But um, you are taught. There are schools. There are areas that you can go. But there are also not. So you can just go out and start beating things up. Um, but during um, during your training, you're taught a lot about the second era. Just due to the fact that, you know, a dungeon hunter should fight another dungeon hunter. Um, during this time, though, of the second era, people left the towns who did not agree with the politics and the fighting to create their own factions. Um, they, they brought, uh, um, 
Oh, they brought on um, uh, the Raider factions as they grew more appealing. So they, they bought into it. So they were more like, oh, maybe the Raiders kind of have something else going on. Um, but the Raiders groups didn't really have any laws or any formal uh, government. Um, so it was only led by people that they trusted. Um, so these groups would be beginning pillaging out in, uh, encampments of towns to gain the resources, as we know the Raiders. Um, so um, the, the third era, though, was Rise of Monsters. I actually named this one because um, the third era started when the dungeon hunters were still fighting each other. Um, and did not notice the growth of the monsters, these towers. So the towers actually have a magical indignation to them, um, but there's no magic in the universe yet. Um, there's no magic in Tower Forcer. There's no magic in, you know, the Dungeon Hunter universe as of yet. Um, will there be? Who knows? We don't know. Um, but in that third era, we see monsters and raiders um they became friendly with each other and they became more powerful by forming these groups of raiding parties um the most legendary monsters were created in this era uh, with the attacks of the towns on the dungeon hunters had no choice but to come together and fend off the onslaught of the monsters um this era bred a very tough and hardcore dungeon hunter um and this this era was mainly filled with war. It wasn't a very good, uh, very good era at all. Um, but the fourth era, so we are in like 120 years now or so. Um, but this this started after most of the raiders and monsters had been defeated, with a surplus of dungeon hunters. Many of them went into retirement now, um, and as if there there was not enough monsters to fight, they didn't have enough glory and riches to go after. Um, it was mainly a, a job uh, now that became mostly as a title uh, for people. Um, and they didn't use really the knowledge that was passed on. Um, much of this era, there was not really anything going on. Um, no monsters or no raiders really attacked much. Um, towns began to grow. More settlements began to pop up and throughout the kingdom. So Blocky really flourished through the fourth era. You know, things kind of got you know, quiet, uh, they became docile, and things really started to become a a pleasant place to live. Um, so yeah, yeah. Which brings us into the fifth era, um, which was mainly um, a peace era. Um, it's definitely called a peace era for a reason. Um, but, um, as that happened, many people began to populate the towns, and the three main cities became very popular. Um, and, but the other cities in the kingdom began to grow as well and become more trading hubs. Um, dungeon hunters uh, were still taught, uh, but only as a hobby as the kingdom, uh, as it was not harsh anymore out there. Um, what was not known, though, was that the monsters, and mainly the raiders, so the, at, when I talk about monsters and when I talk about raiders, they are two different factions. Think about that. As, think about them as factions. The raiders are, are humanoid. They are they are people who did not agree with the kingdom and are wanting to better themselves through different ways of the kingdom. Monsters are little monsters. <laughs> so they're like um, and they are they are things, they are beings, they are entities that are from the underworld. And we'll get into that a little bit more. That's that's a really big part of the lore. Like, oh man. I'm not, we're going to go through the errors and maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, remind me. Um, so yeah, so but in the end of the fifth era, a lot of these raiders had been infiltrating a lot of the hierarchies um, and of the three main towns and they had become um, people of power in the kingdom where they wanted to kind of topple it. The sixth era um, evolved um, how dungeon hunters learned the trade. Um, much of the trade was now passed down through younger generations through family. Um, if you didn't really have relatives that were a dungeon hunter, 
uh, you couldn't learn all of the knowledge that there was to know. Um, there were no schools anymore. There were really nobody doing anything. Uh, people tried to learn the way of the Dungeon Hunter through old books, and some people could teach it, but it was definitely difficult to find either of those people. Um, in the last six years of the Sixth Era, a legendary Dungeon Hunter named Bruce popped out of the middle of nowhere. Um, this is my favorite story. The story of Bruce and what becomes of Bruce and what you have to do to find Bruce is the best. And you know what's even cooler is it's based on a true story. I like and like I I pulled it. Yes, it it, it is vaguely based on a true story. Robert de Bruce and his story and what happened. And I think that that it is so fitting and it is so magical to have something like that, that is not only kind of like this, but is, is a, is almost a motto and a, in a, um, thing of mine. You just don't give up. And like, if any of you know who Robert DeBruce is, and if you've seen the movie, or if you, if you've gone in and like, if you probably nobody has done as much research on this man as I have, to be honest with you, because man, I've just sat there and watched and learned and just oh my god there's so much cool stuff about this and then there's the scottish and irish and the old english stuff like oh my god you can just it's a rabbit hole that you can go down and just just, just oh my god it's crazy um so i'm i'm so excited about that to have kind of that story and to share that story again with you through the story of Balaki and about the Dungeon Hunters. Because this story is also a, a foundation of the modern day Dungeon Hunter and why they're kind of doing what they're doing. So let me give you the rundown of it. Um, so Bruce came from the Sixth Era, okay? The last 10 years of the Sixth Era, a legendary Dungeon Hunter named Bruce popped out of the middle of nowhere. He was an overnight sensation taking on small raider camps and what monsters were left, okay? Little did anybody know, though, at the same time, these raiders were being taken out by Bruce. He was infiltrating these things. He was able to stop the plot of the overthrow of the government and all of the main three cities. He did that, okay? Finding this caused the raiders and monsters to be given away and beginning attacking the cities massive war broke out because of this guy okay um but with limited number of dungeon hunters to help the three main cities uh and towns a lot of the villagers didn't know how to fight and didn't need to fight so a lot of it was just mass casualties uh and during this time people realized that there needed to be a better way to train and create dungeon hunters um the fighting and pillaging of the towns lasted for years, and, and Bruce cemented himself as a great le and legendary dungeon hunter. Would go to these rescues and and help these people, and, and go to these towns and make sure that things were okay, and do as much as he could. Um, and there was an especially good uh, this oh this was especially good when the raiders began to ready uh, scripts teaching them how to summon a legendary beast. So the raiders actually started looking into the underworld and, and how to get things situated. And the, the the Diary of the Soul Diggers, oh God, I don't know if any of you read that on the Discord. I don't know if I posted all of that. Oh man, that's so cool. I love it. Again, there's so much lore. <laughs> um, but so the Soul Diggers, let's take a moment and pause. When, when the raiders, and when these people realized that they were being backed up against and Bruce was actually doing something good and trying to uh, stop them, the Raiders um, had realized that there was a way that they could summon these monsters themselves. So these monsters just kind of showed up out of the middle of nowhere. And what would happen is, is that they would be vanquished and they'd be gone. Or would they be? So what would happen is, is 
that when a dungeon hunter or when a beast was killed, they found out that their souls would travel deep into the earth, deep into the land. And they were wondering why. Why is this possible? What's underneath there? The underworld. So the underworld in the land of the dungeon hunters in, in Balanki is a physical place where your soul is gone and and it's almost trapped and everybody has this happen there is a there is a hierarchy in the underworld and there is a a good area and then there is a bad area where your souls can live happily or tormentfully um for the rest of eternity where you can rest or there is an actual hell but the raiders found a way that they could get these souls back they found a way that they could dig into the earth and find souls themselves who did not want to be in the underworld trying to escape. And they helped them. Well, as they learned to do this more, they found a legendary beast, Vanath. Now, Vanath's history is very scarred and very mysterious itself, but what we do know is that in the Sixth Era, he came back. It came back. It's not a he, it's not a she, it's not a... It's an it. The beast is massive. Let me see if I can find Van Ath's photo for you. Let me see. Because I'll tell you what. It sends shivers down the spine of even myself. see if I can pull up Vanath for you. And we're not going to give you the full image. No, no, no. We're just going to give you a piece here. Can we? There we go. Um, let's see. Yes. So this is the beast, Vanath, right here. So you can kind of see him there in the, in the card center. Now, Vanath is huge, gigantic. No beast has ever been bigger, and no beast I don't think ever will be bigger again. But the evil that Vanath had, the, the hatred that it had for Balaki and for the world in general was crazy. And these, these dungeon hunters, Many of them fell. Including a lot of people that Bruce knew. So in the meantime of when Bruce was fighting off all of these monsters and all of these raiders and protecting people, he trained a few people. He, he found a few people. And, well, it lasted for years. And when they summoned, the raiders summoned Vanath, they succeeded with this and a legendary and great beast. Many of the dungeon hunters and civilians fought this monster one-on-one -on -one and they fell. They fell and many lives were lost. There was one that survived and it was Bruce. But on that day, um, he overcame the beast and vanquished it back to the depths of hell on that day though bruce's life changed forever now i'm not going to spoil it for you because this is one of the main plots for the tabletop rpg that we're going to write but for some reason bruce disappeared that day after the day that van ath fell bruce was gone nobody knows where he went he's gone though and has left the entire area open. Now this brings us, this brings us into the seventh era, right where Tower Enforcer kicks off, okay? It's the era where uh, 
free of trying to get all the gains and riches, dungeon hunters are once again in high demand. And uh, demand is left where the monsters and raiders uh, are still scattered everywhere. Everything's a little disorganized, but it's, it's definitely having them scattered everywhere and then people trying to pick them off. Most raider camps now have riches and knowledge stolen from the towns, while the dungeon hunters are now sent to retrieve and deliver these items back safely. Now, a lot of these dungeon hunters, a lot of them, all of them, in fact, that you see here on the screen are from the seventh air, other than Bruce. Bruce is from the sixth. But every one you see here is from the seventh air. Now, these dungeon hunters are the only well-known dungeon hunters. There were other ones that existed in the kingdom. And we'll learn a little bit more about those. And maybe you yourself are one of them. Maybe one of you is a dungeon hunter that is facing through and going through and trying to help out. But the last 10 years of the seventh era are most important. The War of Snowbush occurs. Now Snowbush is a, is a northern town up on top. It's one of the main three city locations, okay? It's mainly in the northeast of the kingdom. Snowbush is on the border of the snow belt, okay? Snowbush's weather can be described as random at best. Uh, snow one day, sunny, hot the next. But the day the war started, it began to snow, and it has not stopped since. Now, what happened? Snowbush was a great town with many hardworking men and women, okay? More settled there due to its peaceful nature and high number of dungeon hunters. A lot of dungeon hunters went there. But the day that it never stopped snowing was the day the legendary monster Vanath attacked. Vanath returned. No one knows how and no one knows why it was summoned again. Three teams of dungeon hunters and city folk were set forth to defeat the legendary monster. One group faced the monster head on. The other set out to find Bruce, to learn the, his wisdom and to learn of the ways. And the last tried to find out who summoned it. The group that tried to find the ones who summoned it found a cult. And that's all you'll know from there. The last group, and I'm not going to tell you about the group that happened to Bruce. I'm not going to tell you about that group, because again, you'll learn about it. But the last group that went up against the monster, against Vanath, suffered mass casualties. Many many dungeon hunters fell. They all fought violently, but they all failed. The monster took control of Snowbush. Snowbush is no longer under the kingdom's control. It was under this monster's control. Vanath held it there with, with minions and beasts and other people. The monster took it and drove everyone else out. Which brings us to the eighth era which we're not going to learn about. We're not going to learn about much more of the 8th era because the RPG takes place in the 8th era. But those are the eras. Those are the, those are the things that happen. And now each era as well, after the 7th era, the 8th era, the 9th era, who knows? <laughs> those are all going to be expansions. I'm really excited too because we're going to kind of be able to tell a story while releasing new content for you guys. So, not only are you going to have Tower Forcer that has updates to the game, that has those eras being placed into it, but as well as the tabletop RPG, which then will have stories being told in those eras as well. So, not only are you accompanied with Tower Forcer as going through as a dungeon hunter and just facing off against the towers, but you are then going to have an in-depth tabletop RPG that is going to allow you to change the course of the story yourselves. And I'm not even kidding. We're going to set up a way that you yourselves can submit what your team has done, what your adventure looks like, and you're going to shape the stories of Vladki. It's going to show a, a massive storyboard of, yes, where there's the main story of Ekim and the main story of Lucius and the main story of Bruce, wherever he might be. But your stories as well could f could could change the stories forever for all of these other dungeon hunters. And it's going to be amazing. And I'm so excited. So 
yeah. Yeah, so those are the eras. That's the story of the Dungeon Hunter universe. That where we have come from and what we are doing now. And of course, there are always those little stories. And Lucius could tell you. Lucius, one of our Dungeon Hunters, is a librarian and trade. And he could tell you that there is so much more that I missed out on. <laughs> but, yeah. I'm actually really excited. I'm really excited to share this story with you guys, finally. I'm excited to finally sit down and talk with you guys more and more each and every single week about the story. There's Lucius right there. But more stories about how, who knows about what Marsha is holding in her hand right there, right now. Who knows what happens to Vanath at the end of the story? Does Vanath take over? Because I'll tell you what. The story of Balaki. The Dungeon Hunter universe is not like your typical heroes always win. It really isn't. It is a story of glory. It is a story of, of kingdoms. It's a story of time itself. To where these people may be etched into the tomes of, of the Dungeon Hunters lore and and stories that are told down from generations. But where are those stories being told from? Are they being, you know, told from the highest grandeur's castles and, and, and cities that have been around for hundreds of years? Or are they from the jail cell or dungeon of Vanath's kingdom where he has taken over and there is no kindness or anything left? And that's, that's what I like about this story, is that we don't know where it's going to end up. And is that you all have a, a way to shape and form the stories yourself. And maybe, sadly, the Dungeon Hunters will fall, and they will not come back. Maybe this game is going to change itself in the Ninth Era. Who knows? Maybe, hint, hint. There will be mass amount of war. And the dungeon hunters you see here on your screen right now are only a small part of the story that are going to be played in a much longer, much grander, much more in-depth line of stories that could have ever been. So thank you. That is my story and I'm sticking to it. But, um... That is some more for you on this Friday morning. So I hope your tea is not cold. Is mine? A little bit. So what I'm gonna go do is I'm gonna go warm up my tea. I am going to go write some more. <laughs> and I am going to balance more on Tower Enforcer and we're gonna get things rolling for you guys. Cause I'm sick and tired of talking about it and I want you guys to finally play it, so. Thank you guys so much for joining me this morning. I appreciate it. I will see you guys hopefully Monday morning. We're going to do this again, I think. Um, we're going to do this every so often. Uh, but yes. So enjoy your music. Enjoy your day. And I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Hey, and why don't you go play a board game while you're at it, okay? Peace, guys.